He has set forth thousands of promises in his word to meet every need that we've got and to fulfill his will through you. He cannot, listen carefully to me, he cannot fill, fulfill his will in your life in the church until we start believing him again for all that he's provided. Uh, it, just common logic would tell you that if God has provided every means by which you can live victoriously and fulfill the commission and your purpose in life, then it's just common logic to believe that he expects us to appropriate these promises so that we can do it. And so he has told us that, that all things we ask in prayer, believing we shall receive, and that he's given us everything to, to live and to minister victoriously. And he's shown me very clearly how that faith is the key to appropriating all of these promises. Now, Bible faith has two elements. First of all, the first element is what God promises you he will do for you in his word. And the second aspect of faith, Bible faith, is your response to it. For example, in James 5, we're told the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Now, that's his promise that he makes us, and from that point on, he doesn't do a thing until you do something. He tells you what he will do there in James 5, and from that point, he deals with us on the basis of what we say are due, uh, how we go about uh, meeting the conditions that are set forth in James 5. There are about five or six. That's why we say there are no exceptions to his promises, but there are conditions. And one of the most significant, important conditions is asking. I mean, the promises of God are not fulfilled to us automatically because he loves us and all of that. He lets people die that he loves because they won't believe the promise of healing, for example. I see Christians going through life poverty-stricken because they don't believe they have anything in this life. You'd be surprised how many come and tell me uh, about the rich young ruler that uh, Jesus told him to give it all up and they ignore all of the other verses. Uh, I usually tell them, well, he didn't tell Zacchaeus to give up his riches because Zacchaeus had already given up his affection for them. But uh, the rich young ruler had not given up his affection for them, so he had to turn them loose. He could have kept his riches if he'd given up his affection for them. Jesus. Uh, commanded that he give up all of his riches because he knew his heart ahead of time. And so uh, <laughs> uh, we must ask. Salvation is promised in the Bible, but it isn't given to a sinner because it's promised. He isn't going to be saved if he believes it's promised. He must believe, of course, but he's going to be saved when he appropriates that promise for himself. The only reason I wasn't saved a day, week, month, year sooner than I was was not because it wasn't promised. It wasn't because I didn't believe that I had been promised salvation. In fact, I believed, I discovered after I went to the seminary many years later, that I believed as a sinner more about the Bible than some of the professors in the liberal seminary that taught me. Uh, that's, uh, that's remarkable, because be, even as a lost person, I believed it was the Word of God. But I wasn't saved because I believed it. I was not saved until I appropriated it for myself. And so there are ways of appropriating the promises of God. Often people will say, I don't understand uh, why I don't receive an answer. I ask and ask and I still don't receive. Well, often it's because we don't know how to pray the prayer of faith. Uh, Jesus' disciples did not know how because in Luke 11, 1, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, it doesn't mean they hadn't prayed before, but they could never pray. They'd never prayed like they heard Jesus praying because he always got an answer to his prayers. So, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And so there is a correct way of doing anything to receive an answer. And that's certainly true of prayer, and yet we don't seem to think it's true of prayer. It's just like dialing a phone. You don't get the party because, you know, you just start dialing certain numbers at random. You'd never make contact. You have to know the number. You have to know how. You have to dial the right number. And so it is with prayer. There are certain essential principles set forth in the Word of God to enable us to pray the prayer of faith. We must know them. We must use them. That's where anointed teaching comes in, because God is restoring uh, the, the principles of faith back to his people as he's filling them with the Holy Spirit and is able to appropriate them. So I want this morning to deal with the prayer of faith, how to pray the prayer of faith, and set forth for you the basic conditions. There are five. First of all, I'll deal just briefly with some of these um, for obvious reasons because more are more significant than others. Some are, some are almost obvious when I point them out to you. But there are five conditions 
that you must meet to pray the prayer of faith. If we fail in any of these, then our prayer will be ineffective. First of all, we must pray the first principle. For the prayer of faith, we must pray with a conscience that is clear before God. In other words, confession is the first principle to effective prayer. 1 John 3, 20 to 22, we are in there we are told that if our hearts condemn us not, then we have this confidence that anything we ask of God, he gives us. Now, did you hear what he said? If you have no sin on your heart, nothing unconfessed, if your conscience is not bothering you, then whatever you ask, you can have from him. Anything we ask, he says. In other words, confession is the first step to effective prayer, removed by confession, anything that would be a hindrance. You know if God has been talking to you about something. You know if there's some uh, weakness or besetting sin that you've not confessed. You, you know many times as you kneel to pray that there's something between you and God and you just can't seem to break through. Well, that's because the conscience is not clear before God. So the first principle of effective prayer is to pray with a conscience that is clear before God. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. God says, any man that turns away from his ear from hearing his, the word, even his prayer shall be an abomination. We're told in John 9 that God does not hear the prayer of sinners. And so we must remove by confession anything that we know in our spirits, our hearts, would be a hindrance or a barrier to the answer of that prayer. Now, this is true. You know that, that there have been times when you have... Uh, tried to pray and you just could not get through. There have been times when I would kneel down and when I would not dealt with something and I would try to pray that prayer of faith and break through and the Spirit would say, now go deal with that thing because you're not going to get through till you do. And uh, I would have to deal with it. Yeah, maybe a little bit of pride or something, you know, uh, or some uh, bit of impatience you had manifested uh, to someone and you, you had tried to justify that by saying you were just getting them straightened out, you know. Uh, they needed to be corrected, they were wrong, and actually the fault was in you. Uh, as you pray in these things, the Spirit will bring them to mind, then you clear that up with God, and then you can pray with a clear conscience. I had a, a young man came in one of my meetings when I was teaching on the occult, and I was showing how that if you've been dabbling with uh, the Ouija board and fortune-telling, astrology, hypnosis, and that sort of thing, that it opens the door to oppression. Well, he got all upset about it. He uh, rushed out after the meeting and told his wife that he's read cards and uh, told fortunes and played with the Ouija board and he said it's never bothered me and he was so upset he got a migraine headache and his wife had to pray for him. You know, it didn't bother him but it really upset him. And, uh, and he did not have the baptism, his wife did. And he was really upset with me but he, he kept observing our church and saw that the baptism was real and the spirit of love uh, that was being manifested through us. And about six months later, he, he came to me and he says, I don't know what it is that you've got, but I want it. He says, uh, this is real. This is real Christianity. And uh, he said, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so I prayed for him and nothing happened. Now, I, I didn't expect it would, really, and for another reason, because I knew he had unconfessed sin on his heart. When that occultism is not confessed, often it will hinder one from receiving the baptism. I see this over and over and over. When they deal with that, then this binding off of their spirits is released and they can come through to the baptism with the evidence. And so he didn't, uh, he couldn't believe for it. He couldn't exercise faith for it, even though he wanted it. And so I said to him, well, I said, brother, I will tell you, if you will let me, why you can't receive the baptism or why you're not receiving it, why you don't have faith for it. And I said, it's, it's this occult sin that you have in your life, this dabbling in the occult that you thought did not hurt you. I said, uh, this must be confessed. It's a hindrance between you and God. Uh, I said, if you will confess this, you'll receive the baptism. He confessed it, and he did receive the baptism. Uh, so if there's anything binding you, you want to, to get rid of that. Now, that's an obvious thing, but it needs to be pointed out. It, I mean, the most obvious things are what we're missing in the prayer of faith. The second principle I want to give you to pray the prayer of faith is this. First of all, to pray with a conscience clear before God. Secondly, to pray with a heart that's clear before your brother. You see, effective prayer stems from a right relationship between you and God, and also it must be from a right relationship between you and your brother. Not only between God and man, but man and man. Uh, many prayers are hindered because of a lack 
of a forgiving spirit on our part. Now, I read you as our text, Mark 11, 22 to 24, where Jesus tells us how to pray the prayer of faith, to speak the word of faith, and to believe that we have received when we pray. But he did not stop there in teaching on the prayer of faith. He went on in verses 25 and 26 to give us a condition to effective prayer. As I've said over and over this week, there are no exceptions to his promises, but there are conditions. And because we don't know the conditions, we miss many times, and we try to justify that and say, well, there must be exceptions. But notice he said, as you stand praying the prayer of faith, if you discover that you've got ought against your brother, he says, forgive him first, or else you will not be heard of God. In other words, you can't pray the prayer of faith if there's any enmity or uh, hindrance between you and your brother. You see, many Christians, I find, are very, very careful to confess their sins to God and get their conscience clear before God. They ask him to forgive them, but they don't see often that their forgiveness depends upon them forgiving someone else. There's hardly a Christian that doesn't need to deal with this thing before they pray. Their hearts are filled many times with resentment and hate and envy and jealousy. And a lot of things you might be surprised uh, that are there in your hearts many times that you need to confess. You see, when you fail to forgive your brother and think that isn't important, what you're doing, you're breaking down the very bridge over which you must cross to get to God. And so you have to deal with that first. I mean, anger and hate and resentment and envy and jealousy and all of these things will bind your prayers, surround them with walls too high for your voice to be heard uh, by God. A woman came to me once wanting deliverance, and uh, she confessed in counseling with her a uh, 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 spirit of hate against her father for something he had done to her as a child. And I said, and she'd been trying to get deliverance for many years. I said, well, this is what's blocking your deliverance. It's your resentment. I said, you must forgive your father because God can't deal with you and heal you and deliver you <clears throat> until you forgive him. Well, she said, I can't. In fact, what she meant was, I discovered later, I refused to forgive him. And, of course, she couldn't be delivered. We couldn't help her. Praise God, now she is delivered. That was after 25 years of her seeking deliverance. But you've got to give up these things. I know another woman bent double by a spirit of infirmity, just like that woman in, in uh, Luke 13. Bent double because of resentment toward her husband. She knows she has it. She confesses that she has it, but she hasn't given it up. Resentment because of her uh, certain aspects about his ministry. She didn't want him in the ministry. In fact, I know of two ministers' wives that are a little more than vegetables, mentally ill because of resentment. And you can't be delivered until you get rid of that resentment towards your wife or your husband. Arthritis often is caused by resentment. You give up your resentment and claim your healing, and you watch what happens many times uh, to arthritis. Now, I know it disturbs people a lot of time to be told they've got spirits of infirmity and uh, uh, that sort of thing, but somebody has to tell you, and so uh, I'll be the one that, uh, if it offends anybody, you can blame me, uh, I'll, uh, and then that'll make it easier for the next person that comes and tells you, but that time maybe you can receive it. But nevertheless, this is true. You give up your resentments, and you'll find some of these oppressing spirits leaving uh, your body and life that are oppressing and binding I'm not suggesting always, of course, that a thing is a spirit, but I'm saying you'd be surprised how many times it is. But we must pray with a conscience clear before God. We must pray with a heart clear before our brother, if it's to be effective. The third principle of effective prayer I want to share with you this morning is this, that we must pray uh, through an approved intercessor. I only know of one. Do you know of any others? Well, I know some people speak of others, but there's only one, and that's Jesus. You've got to pray in the name of Jesus because we're told in Ephesians 2.18 that it is through him, only through him, that we have access to the Father. That's true in salvation. That's true in deliverance or prayer uh, for any need you may have. Paul tells us in Colossians 3.17, he says, whatever you do in word or deed. Now, prayers are words. Whatever you do in word or deed, <clears throat> do all in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, that's pretty plain. Whatever you do, do in his name. Jesus said, ask anything in my name and I will do it. He tells us in, that's in John 14. In John 16, 
He said to his disciples, Now, I've been with you, and you didn't have to pray in my name because all you had to ask me, all you had to do was ask me because I was here with you. He says, Now I'm leaving, and he says, Now ask the Father in my name whatever you desire, and he'll give it to you. We have to come to him in his name, and yet I hear Christians constantly, I hear ministers praying to the Father and never mentioning the name of Jesus. My friends, we must come to God in the way he has ordained. Uh, as sinners, we must approach his throne uh, through an approved intercessor, and he's told us who this is, the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son. And we can't say now, uh, we ask this in thy name, Lord, or we ask this in thy name, Father, because he didn't tell us to come in his name. He said to come through the one that gives you access to me, the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. Boy, you'll find verse after verse in the New Testament that witnesses with one accord that we have to come to God through the means that he's provided. Healing is through that name, Mark 16. He said, in my name. He didn't say in the Father's name or the Spirit's name, but in my name you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, I'm not trying to set up some binding legalistic formula here. Uh, 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 one brother said to me, you always have to say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You should never say in the name of Jesus. I said, brother, you can't bind me with that. Uh, if a person prays in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, fine. But I said, if he prays in the name of Jesus, that's fine. If he prays in the name of Christ, that's fine. Uh, in fact, I use all three of those ways. But uh, the point is, uh, we must see that God accepts our prayers when we come through the one he's ordained to receive our petitions through. He says, come into my presence in the name of my Son, and I will hear you. Uh, you would be surprised that it's not always important the words you use in your prayer. In fact, some of the greatest answers I get are the simplest prayers, very, very simple prayers, like saying, Lord, I believe that promise in Jesus' name. Now, he knows which one I'm believing. I point to it. <laughs> uh, and you get tremendous answers. I saw a Jew saved on just quoting John 14:14 14, 14 one morning, and all it says is, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do. Praise the Lord. Well, anyway, uh, it's not always important what words you use. But be, be sure you use the right name, because that's the name the Father honors. That's the name the angels reverence. That's the name before whom the demons will tremble when you use that name. Smith Wigglesworth uh, from London, the apostle of faith that I'm sure most or many of you have heard of, a great apostle of faith in the early part of this century, uh, 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 tells an incident one time where they had gone into a sick room where a man was incurably ill and it was terminal illness in the last stages of it, ready to die, and uh, three or four ministers gathered around his bed and prayed, and the man uh, had called them, you know, to come, to come and pray, and uh, nothing happened. And the man uh, was very despondent because of it. He actually expected to get better immediately. And uh, as the minister stepped out, because it had, it had affected the ill brother so adversely, they stepped out in the hall, and Smith Wigglesworth tells about how one brother spoke up, and he said, Would you, brethren, go back into the sick room with me and do something that I feel impressed to do? They said, Yes, what is it? He says, Well, come on in, and I'll show you. And they gathered around the bed. He said, Now, all of us hold hands and hold his hands, and he says, Don't do anything but speak the name of Jesus. And he says that they began to speak it very softly, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the man was on his side, and the first thing you know, he turned over. <laughs> they got a little louder, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the first thing you know, they said he sat up, and they said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And they began to shout the name, and the man jumped out of bed, dressed himself, and went down stairs totally healed. Oh, it's the name of Jesus, my friends, that's important. You better believe it. Sometimes you only have time to call out the name of Jesus when the old planes falling are, uh, you, you, uh, 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 you're skidding on ice toward a truck. Uh, we've seen God straighten out cars. We're on the highway all the time and just miss trucks by a fraction of an inch because we've, we've cried out the name of Jesus in, uh, in faith uh, because this is all you have time for. I was in a meeting recently in Illinois where the woman was telling me of a miracle that had just taken place a few days before I started the meeting there. She said, we live upstairs, and my daughter, I think she's about 16, I saw the daughter there, she looked about 16, said she started to school the other morning and fell down those steps all the way to the bottom. By the time I got there, she looked like she was dead. She was white as a sheep, out cold, her hip was dislocated, and her leg was broken. And she said, all I could do is reach down and says, when I 
picked her up in my arms. She, she said, all I could say was, Jesus. And she said, as soon as I said the name, that hip went back in place, that leg straightened out, the bone set itself. She came to, got up, and went to school like nothing had happened. Oh, praise the Lord. There's power in that name. You better, you better get with the name first and then figure out what you're going to say second. I was in another meeting where a brother told me that name is powerful. He said, I'm a farmer, and my son, a teenage son, said we were unhooking a tractor uh, just a little t a while ago. Well, this had happened recently, too, and we had a trailer load of fertilizer on the back of the tractor with a hitch, and he said, I was on the tractor, and I thought, and the son was unhitching the thing, he said, and I started to pull away. I thought he was out of the way, and he wasn't. He had his foot under that hitch, and it fell on his foot, and he said he just had tennis shoes on, and he crushed it into a pulp. And as he lay there in agony and screaming, he had his foot under it. He couldn't get out. I just, he said, I rushed over there, and he says, all I said was, Jesus. And he said, a circle of light just immediately surrounded us. And he said, I jacked that thing up, got it off his foot. He did that first, by the way. He got it off his foot and then held his son and said, Jesus. And he said, the circle of light came around us. And he said, I just sat there and watched that foot straightened up and come back in place. Praise God. He says, we took them down, took him down to the doctor to, to have it looked at. And they couldn't, they x-rayed it, couldn't find a thing wrong. And he said it was nothing but jelly and pulp when it was under that trailer hitch. And he said it was the name of Jesus that did the healing. Oh, pray in that name, my friends. When, when I go into a place and I hear people praying these eloquent prayers and they never mention the name of Jesus, I feel, I feel so sad in my heart because I know they're not getting through because the Bible says we have access by him to the Father. The fourth <clears throat> principle of effective prayer is this, is that we must pray according to his will. Pray according to the will of God. This is 1 John 5, 14 and 15. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. <clears throat> and we know that if he hears us, we have the petitions that we desired of him. You see, God cannot answer a prayer that is not prayed according to his will. Because, you see, he would be contradicting his own word to try to answer a prayer if it wasn't in harmony with his will. You say, well, how do I know his will? Well, here again is where we emphasize the importance of knowing his word. You've got to pay the cost of getting into his word. I don't mean like reading daily Bible readings. Fine if you do that, but I mean getting into his word. Now that you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, letting the Spirit show you the deeper levels of truth in his word. Uh, get out under anointed teaching like you're doing. I mean, take advantage of it. Uh, I, I just uh, don't understand people uh, that God will send a ministry into their city and they don't come out and then they'll call you on the phone and want special counseling and that sort of thing while you're in the town. And I'll say, come out and hear the anointed teaching. You'll get your answer right in the meeting. Because I said, God knows your problem and he sent me there and there'll be things come out of certain faith principles and so forth set forth that will meet every need you've got. Because people come to me after and, and uh, who thought they needed counseling many times. They'll come and they'll say, well, I don't need counseling now because you've answered. Uh, what I needed to know. You've told me what to do in the message and in the teaching. And so we've got to pay that cost or we'll not be able to pray according to the will of God. There are no shortcuts to faith. Faith cometh by hearing and believing the word. And that means just what it says. It comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word. In fact, if you get this on tape, then listen to it about 20 times. You'll hear something every time you didn't hear this morning. And your faith will grow on the anointed teaching of the word. God is raising up ministry in this end time so that we can know his will. Because he cannot answer us contrary to his will. Now, you don't have to worry about exhausting the resources of heaven. There's more there than you'll ever pray out of heaven. Uh, I promise to you, but the thing is... Uh, there are many areas where your life will be defeated and ineffective because you do not know his will or you do not know how to pray. I mean, you can't ask God, for example, to show you the date of the second advent. You see, that would be contrary to his will because he's already told you that you can't pray that. No one knows that, he, Jesus said, except the Father. Uh, I know of a man when a certain evangelist down in the States died. He had, this evangelist had a tremendous miracle ministry. I personally heard of this case where a man began to fast and pray for 40 days for that man's ministry. He wanted to be where he was. Well, it wasn't God's will that he do that, and he didn't find out what God's will was first. 
And so he wanted, he fasted and prayed for 40 days. He wanted to get where that man was. Well, he did. He died. He got to be with him. But he wasn't intending to get that way. He meant to get to where he was in his ministry. And uh, you can't pray that God would uh, take all your trials away and your tribulation, because if you know his word, you know you can't pray that prayer in faith. For he says, it is by much tribulation we enter the kingdom of God, Acts 14, 22. He told a man that I heard of to go, to go command a brother who had withered legs in a wheelchair, go command him to rise and walk, that he's going to be healed today. And this evangelist went, what he thought was in obedience, he went, he laid hands on him and prayed for his healing, and nothing happened. And God spoke to him and said, I didn't tell you to pray for him, I told you to command him to rise and walk. There is a difference. God's looking for people today who can speak the word of faith. There's a time to pray, but there's a time to say. And so when he obeyed the Lord and commanded him, he came right out of the wheelchair whole. So we must learn the will of God so that we can pray and act in harmony with the will, because his will, because... In only this way are our prayers effective. You see, God answers the prayer of faith, and all we receive from God comes by faith, but our faith can rise no higher than what we know, K-N-O-W, know God has said he will do. And once you know what he can do, and you know the conditions, then you can pray with absolute faith. The reason my faith is so high, I know what he's promised. You say, well, uh, you mean you know everything's promised? No, but I suppose I know most of it. After all, you can't spend 20 years in the Word, uh, 14, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and not learn something. You could just learn it by accident. Uh, as much time as I spend in the Word, I don't have a desire for anything else. Uh, I've been called a, a bookworm. I've been called worse than that. But it pays off. Stop your machine at this point and turn tape over if you believe. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's sing that song, Wonderful, Wonderful Jesus. It's so easy for the human beings to get their eyes on man. Stop your machine at this point and turn tape over. so easy for the human beings to get the uh, I've been called a, a bookworm. I've been called worse than that. But it pays off. And get into the Word, and you'll know what he promised. That's why I can look a cancer in the face and with assurance and tell the person, if you believe it, when I pray, you're healed. I can pray that prayer as easily as I'd pray for this brother over here if he said he had a little toothache this morning. Because I don't heal them anyway, and I know what God said he'll do if they will believe and meet the condition. For he says the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And I know all the other conditions that, that I'm not telling him, now you're going to feel better right away. Because uh, people come out and, you know, you, they think if you don't have a manifestation immediately or something, you didn't get the answer. God doesn't say anything about, about the answer being in the area of sight or feeling. He says, take the answer when you pray and you shall have it. God has healed me from many things. From, from many things. He's still healing me. There's one condition. He said, I have to walk out by faith. He healed me in 1966. He's shown it in vision and dream many, many times, the healing. But he has said, walk it out by faith. I will manifest it in my time. Don't you even ask me about healing. You are healed because you're healed by faith. That's Mark 11:24. And so uh, if people don't come out and hear me teach and, and know that God has said this, then they're missing one of the most important conditions to get their prayers answered. They give up a lot of times because they think they didn't receive anything if they didn't feel any better immediately or if they had to battle some symptoms for a while and that sort of thing. But this is faith for feeling if you go by feelings. Faith for healing is believing you are healed because God says you are. Now, he said it. If I just came and said it, then it might work and it might not. But he said it. He said you were healed at Calvary. And so we have to get our prayers in line with his word in order to pray according to his will. And we must know his word in order to do that. You see, if you don't know his word, then you will be mixed up and confused and unsettled in your mind in, when it's a serious matter, an emergency especially. For example, there is prevalent today the popular but unscriptural idea that it's God's will for 
Christians to be sick, that he sends them sickness for his glory and their good. It's a blessing in disguise. You know, he's going to bless you and humble you with it. And I always say, well, if that's true, then why don't you pray that you stay sick? <clears throat> and if that's true, why don't you pray for cancer for all your children? Then you can all be humble and you can really glorify God. Or you say, how ridiculous. Why, of course it's ridiculous. But that's a logical conclusion to the way the church thinks about healing today. And if you believe it's from God and his will that you be sick to teach you something, then why do you immediately take medicine, run to the doctor, and try to get rid of his will for your life? You better submit to his will. If, it's God, if God's put it on there, you better go to him to get it off. No, sickness is from Satan, Acts 10, 38. Jesus was anointed of God, and he went about healing, <clears throat> healing all who were oppressed of God. No, of the devil, Acts 10, 38. Read Job 1 and 2, and you'll see where Job got his boils. He got them from the devil. And there are many passages that show this. But if we do not know his word, then we'll, we, we, we will uh, fall victim to that popular notion that the church has taught, and I used to teach until the Holy Spirit came, that God sends sickness, it is his will, and he has a purpose in it and all of that. Uh, for his glory, for our good, and it's a blessing in disguise. No, it isn't a blessing in disguise uh, at all. And so for most Christians who believe that, and most do, there's only the unhappy prospect of an endless round of going to doctors, taking drugs and medicines, submitting to surgery and all of that. Christians have to be delivered from that erroneous notion before they can ever uh, develop enough faith to believe God for healing in serious things. I mean, a lot of people who get the baptism can start out believing for little things, but the little things are only the doorway to believing for bigger things. And the only way I know for Christians to be delivered from their erroneous notions is to get them into the Word, because you can't convince them with argument. A teacher does not come to interpret, he doesn't come to explain, he doesn't come to argue anyone into the faith. All a teacher is, he has the gift of teaching and anointing by the Holy Ghost to, to enable him to put the Scriptures together in such a way that you can see them if you will accept them. You can see what God has said. Our literature, and we have a lot of it back there on the table on various subjects. We have one on faith, uh, a book on faith. That literature isn't going to heal you or do anything for you. It's going to point you to the Word. If you don't see it in the Word, you might as well forget the literature. All a teacher is is showing you how to use the Word, because it's the Word that heals. And if you get into the Word, you'll see that healing is provided in the atonement. If he would provide it in the atonement, then it must mean it's for you. And it's promised in the Word. And that, that book will show you how the sickness is from Satan. It will show you how to use your faith. It won't give you faith because that comes from hearing the Word, Romans 10, 17. But the book on faith will show you how to use the faith of God and to appropriate the promises of God. And so I'm saying in order to pray the prayer of faith, you must know what his will is. The only way we can know his will is to know his word. There are no shortcuts. I wish there was. I wish I could just gather everybody in and open their heads and pour it all in and say, now you're all set and you go out and teach somebody else. But, oh, I'll tell you, it took years. It takes years. I'm still learning. And I've had to learn some things the hard way, uh, believe me. Uh, it, there's no easy way to learn the will of God. Uh, he will reveal it to you if you'll pay the cost of it. Now. Fifthly, the fifth principle to pray the prayer of faith is this, is that we must, we must pray with expectation. I mean, <clears throat> many prayers are unanswered for the most obvious reason of all is that people do not pray the prayer of faith in faith. <laughs> I mean, they don't pray with any expectation. They will meet that first condition. They will pray with the conscience clear before God. They'll meet that second condition. They'll pray with a heart that's clear before the brother. Uh, they will meet that third condition. They will pray in Jesus' name. They'll meet the fourth condition. They'll find a promise which is according to the will of God, and they'll claim it. And sometimes they still don't get an answer. You know why? It's because if the answer didn't come soon enough for them, then they give up their faith. They don't hold fast to their confession of faith. They do not really believe God is faithful to fulfill his word if he makes them wait a year for the manifestation or six months or a week. Uh, and so there's no assurance in their heart that God will be faithful to his word, and so there's no expectation. A brother came to me once for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I explained 
how that you don't have to seek and tarry and all of that, that, that uh, I myself, I had been seeking and tarrying for three whole weeks. Now, that's a long time for me when I believe a thing, but I didn't have a teacher. That was many years ago when I asked for the Holy, Seven, Holy Spirit, and I begged and pleaded and fasted and prayed and made restitution, repented. I did all the things you don't have to do to get the baptism. After three weeks, the Lord said, just claim it by faith and begin to speak in faith, and it'll happen, and it happened. So I told this brother that, and I said, now, when I pray for you, you will receive. Give the Holy Spirit your voice, and he'll give you the evidence in new tongues. And so I did just that, and as soon as I laid my hand on his head and said, receive the Holy Spirit, I said, now, you have the Holy Spirit. Give the Holy Spirit your voice. <laughs> Instead of that, he began to say, oh, Lord, you know how much I want this. Lord, give me the new tongues. I said, brother, you don't have to plead. You have the Holy Spirit. You don't have to ask him for it. I said, just believe that you have it and begin to use your voice. And he said, oh, God, you know how long I've been asking for this and begging and pleading. Lord, why don't you fill me with the Holy Spirit? I said, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, act your faith. And this went on and on and on and on. He begged and begged and begged. Well, he didn't get a thing, but he did in about three days. You know why? He stopped begging and started believing. And as soon as he started believing, it happened. It will always happen when you believe, and not while, while you are begging God to do something. Begging is not faith. That's, that's an admission of doubt. If you believe you have received when you pray, Mark 11:24, then you won't be asking him twice for the same thing. You'll be believing you have received when you pray. Uh, you take in the matter of healing. People will ask for the healing, and then if it isn't manifested immediately, uh, they will go back and pray again for it, and again, and again, and again, this repetitious prayer, and eventually they pray themselves out of faith because they prayed themselves out of expectation. I mean, there's a time to stop praying, or you will pray yourself out of faith. Faith knows when to stop praying and start praising. When should you stop praying for a thing? When you believe you have received. Mark 11:24. If you believe you have received, then why are you still praying for a thing? Jesus only cursed the fig tree once. He didn't go back to check up every hour on the hour to see if it withered yet. He only commanded Lazarus to come forth from the grave once, and that's a long way down in that tomb. I've been there. I, they believe they have this, the right location where Lazarus was uh, entombed. And I've been down in that thing, and it's a cave, and you go way down in there, like 50 feet. And it took Lazarus a while to get up, and I just can't feature Jesus. Lazarus, did you hear me? Are you up yet? Are you on the way? Did it work? Lord, did you hear me? I told Lazarus to rise. No, he only said it once. That's faith. Pray faith asks once. And that's too easy for most people, whether you're in Canada or in the States. I find doubt and unbelief and wrong teaching prevails everywhere. That's so easy. You want to make it hard, don't you? If there's just something you could do after you claimed it. But God doesn't want you to do anything. He wants you to believe. He doesn't need your help. He answers you on your faith. And so that's so easy. Most of us keep agonizing instead of accepting. We keep begging instead of believing. We keep praying instead of praising. And we pray ourselves out of faith. Remember, if you pray ten times for a promise of God, you've prayed nine times in unbelief. A brother once said to me, a medical doctor, spirit-filled, who will pray for his seriously ill patients, and he hasn't seen them all healed, and there's a lot of reasons why, of course, because a lot of times they're not believing. But anyway, uh, not knowing quite how to approach it always, he said, I pray for my seriously ill patients to be healed. He says, I can't heal them, let's face it. Uh, they're, they're beyond help. And he said, should we always pray in faith that they'll be healed? Well, I said, brother, why would you pray if you didn't believe they'd be healed? What are you praying about? <laughs> well, he said, I never thought of that. He said, that's right. Why would you want to pray the prayer of faith for a person to be healed and then you doubt whether or not God would heal them? Why even bother? Well, that's right. Why do you bother, friend? <laughs> you see, oh, you thought God didn't hear you because you didn't feel any better immediately. You thought that God hadn't heard you because the circumstances got worse. You thought maybe God wouldn't answer prayer because you didn't feel any better. Why, he didn't say that you would feel better. He didn't say your symptoms would leave right away. He said, believe you have your petition answered when you pray. If you ask anything according to my will, believe you have your petition answered. I have seen uh, most cases not healed instantly. I've seen miracles happen in our meetings, instantaneous things, but I'll tell you most of them are not that way because God's trying to get faith back into the hearts of his people. I prayed for a brother with a cancerous growth on his face, about as big as a walnut, 
And when I said, be healed in the name of Jesus, and I rebuked that cancer, I took my hand off. That thing was as big as ever. I said, you go right on confessing you're healed. If you believe it, I said, it'll disappear. Ten days later, he kept up his confession. The thing fell off. Amen. Well, what if he'd have said the eighth day it must not work? I don't see a bit of change. In fact, he couldn't see any change. It was getting worse. God was bringing it to head so it would fall off of his face. What if he said the ninth day it hasn't happened yet? What would that woman do with the tumor on her neck that kept confessing that it's healed, it's healed, and everyone thought she was crazy? Uh, what would she do because it kept growing? If she went by the way she felt and the way it smelt and the way it looked, you see, you can't go by that. He didn't say to look to see if you were healed. He said, keep your eyes on my word and believe you were healed at Calvary. You keep confessing that. I was in a meeting where I prayed for a baby's broken nose. Yes, I started out the door. The parents brought the baby and said, look at this nose. It was in the shape of a Z. Uh, uh, they had been in an accident. I said, do you believe God will heal this baby? The baby wasn't old enough to believe or disbelieve, so they could believe for the baby. They said, yes, we do. I laid my hand on the baby's nose, took it off, and it was just as crooked as ever. I said, the nose, the bones are set, the nose is healed. Do you believe it? Yes, we believe it. Two days later, I came down the aisle. I'd forgotten all about it. And uh, as I passed the pew, I saw the child, and that nose just as straight as an arrow. Not a bruise or anything. I said, is this the child we claimed healing for? They said, yes. I said, well, then you see what God did. You see, if I would have gone by what it looked like when I removed my hand, the baby wasn't healed. God does not say to believe you'll feel better or the symptoms will improve. He said, believe I've heard your petition because I'm not bound by times and what you see or don't see. I have answered your prayer when you pray. I will manifest it in my own time and way. You see. And so the prayer of faith is simply a prayer of expectation that a thing is going to happen because God said it will happen. Uh, God has ordained prayer in order that he can answer us and meet our needs and fulfill his will through our lives. But there's so much unanswered prayer today. Do you know why there's so much disbelief? There's, there's such a lack of teaching that we don't know how to pray the prayer of faith. There's a popular notion that I hear all the time today. I hear it from the pulpit. I read about it in religious literature, about prayer. You'll see it on signboards as you drive along the highway, that popular notion that prayer changes things. Well, I've got news for you, friends. Prayer doesn't change a thing. Faith changes things, and prayer becomes the channel through which you express faith or doubt. The prayer is just words. And it's the prayer of faith that heals the sick. You can pray yourself blue in the face and die of a cancer and believe in divine healing. But you have got to appropriate that for yourself and pray the prayer of faith and settle the thing and say, it's done. I'll never ask again. It's done in Jesus' name. And so the reason we're not getting answers to prayers is because we're praying words. We're not praying in faith. And there is a big difference between prayer and the prayer of faith. You remember that when you see it again and hear it. Prayer does not change a thing. And the Bible does not say that it does. Man has said that. The prayer of faith will change things every time. There's so much unanswered prayer. Unanswered prayer is such a waste of time. It avails nothing. I mean, can you point to one specific instance, say, in the last month, where you know you've had a definite answer to prayer? Most Christians cannot. Well, praise God, I see a few hands, but most cannot. Well, how would it be to have daily answers to prayer? How would you like to live a life like that? In fact, how would you like to have 100% answers to prayer. Oh, you say, now, who could expect? Well, that's the point. We don't expect. That's what I'm saying. The prayer of faith is a prayer of expectation. Why do you think God ordained prayer and made you these promises to answer 5% or 1% or 10%? Why, if the average Christian got 10% of his prayers answered a year, he'd run around bragging about it and give a testimony to every meeting. He'd bore people to death with his 10% answers. And God wants to give you 100% answers to prayer. Do you think God is foolish as we are and sits up there and ordains a thing and says, I'm sitting here listening, come through, my son. I want to hear your needs and requests. I love you. I want to bless you. I want to get my will fulfilled. And then sit up there and say, uh, well, I think I'll just put a sign on the office today out to lunch or I'm busy. Uh, I don't think I'll answer needs today. It's my, not. I just don't feel up to answering prayers. Why, God is waiting for you to ask so that he can answer. But you have to pray with expectation. He, all through his word, goes overboard, as it were, to encourage you to pray the prayer of faith so that he can answer you. He encourages you to expect an answer. Do you realize that you do not need an appointment 
to have direct communion with the most important being in the universe, that you can talk with him as long as you wish, any time you wish, as a Christian, day or night, whether it's five minutes or one hour or all day, and he's never too busy to give you individual and personal attention, he invites you over and over to do that. Now, men can't deal with you that way. I get calls all the time and requests, you know, for my time and all, and we're just too busy to give it, among other reasons, but not God. People will write me or call me and say, I want to come and spend a couple of days with you. I've got enough problems to sink a battleship. I say, two days, I might be able to give you an hour. I, I say, brother, I'm busy. I say, I, I, you, you're just lucky uh, to catch me at home. I'm on the road all the time. Another brother wrote, I, he says, I want to come spend a week with you. I want to follow you around to all your meetings. He says, I believe this message of faith. I want to learn all I can about it. My wife said, a week? I wish I had a week with him. I mean, a week. But praise God, you'll never get an answer like that from up there. He's the busy, uh, busiest and most important being in this universe, and he says, you just come any time of day or night. You want to stay, stay there for a week talking to me. I'm listening to you. He said, even though I'm busy with the billions of complex affairs of governing this universe, even though I'm constantly in a battle with the forces of darkness, he says, even though I have to stay alert 24 hours a day to keep this human race from annihilating itself and blowing up this planet ahead of schedule, he said, even though my ears are constantly filled with the cries of the needy and the helpless and the sick and the oppressed, he says, I'm never too busy to hear you individually and personally. But he says, the only condition is you must pray in faith. He says, I don't listen to doubt. I don't even have time for people who don't expect me to answer them when they ask me. He says, I just don't have time for that. You mean God doesn't have time for some things? That's right. He doesn't. He told a sister in one of my meetings uh, this very thing. Uh, she told me one time I was to the place where I was so despondent I was going to commit suicide. And she said, the world was so black, I just didn't want to live any longer. She said, as I started out the door, the voice of the Lord came to me audibly. The Lord Jesus Christ said to me, wait a minute, I want to tell you something. And she says, I just don't have time. She says, I'm just giving it up. i got to go. He said, you better listen now, because he said, I've got other things to do. Well, now, how about that? We never figure that God's got other things to do. He's not too busy to hear you if you come to him with expectation and faith, but he's too busy. If you're not willing to come the way he said, or if you're not willing to listen to what he has to say. Yes, he's busy. But he encourages you to take all the limits off of your faith because there are no limits in him. The limits are in us. There are no limitations on God. There's no limit of time or distance. Geography means nothing. You can pray with as much assurance and expectation for a loved one 5,000 miles away that they would be healed or need met as you could if they were standing here before you and you could lay your hands on their head and pray for them or agree with them. I've seen prayers answered distance and time have nothing to do with it. We agree with people for, for loved ones off somewhere constantly in all of our meetings. I don't mean like a time or two, but hundreds of times. And God does answer these prayers where we give him a little faith to work with. A woman just here in Pittsburgh uh, not too long ago uh, came to me right at the close of the meeting, said, my father's off in Mayo Clinic with a tumor on his spine. They're getting ready to operate, and it's serious and may mean his life. She said, would you agree with me? I heard you say in your message, Matthew 18, 19, promises us where two are agreed as touching anything they ask. On the earth it will be done for them of their Father in heaven. She said, would you agree with me that when they examine him in the morning, he's going for surgery, that they won't find anything? I said, I'd be happy to. I'd hardly gotten home till the letter was in the mail. It said when they x-rayed him to get him ready for surgery again, the thing had disappeared completely. And now they're keeping him there, you know, to check up to see what happened to the thing that's supposed to be there. Why, geography and time and distance has nothing to do with it. Or you say, where is that in the Word? Well, you'll just have to come out and hear the Word, friends, because we can't say it all in one message. I gave you one place it was, Matthew 18, 19, where two are agreed. A woman said, can I claim a job for my brother off in Texas? Why, I said, sure. She said, will you agree with me? I said, sure. And the next week she came back to prayer meeting. While we were agreeing at the same hour, the mayor of Lubbock, Texas, calls him up and offers him a job. You can't beat that when the mayor calls you up and answers the prayer. Geography has nothing to do with it. A man asked for deliverance for his wife, demon-possessed, asked the church to send an anointed handkerchief. That's not Baptist doctrine. I couldn't find that in the Bible as a Baptist, but I've discovered that after the Holy Spirit came, Acts 19, 11, and 12. And we did just that. 
I said, it's in the Bible. Let's believe God. We were wrong about the baptism. We could be wrong about this. And so uh, if you don't know what that is, go read it, uh, that they took anointed, they took handkerchiefs, to, and Paul had such an anointing on him that when he, they touched his body, they took them to the sick, those who were demon-possessed, and they were delivered and healed. We did just that, and the man didn't use it for a month, kept it in his desk drawer. But when he did use it, when that wife touched it, she was set free instantly. She was totally demon-possessed, ready for a mental institution. You see, time or geography had nothing to do with that. That was in another town, and 30 days later, another woman said, Can I claim my whole family for salvation? I said, God's just waiting for you to claim your family. He's waiting for you to claim your families. He'll bring them in. He'll bring them to the place they'll believe. And a year later, she says, Let me tell you what God's already done. She said, He's already brought four in. I just sit back and watch him do it. I said, How did you help him get them saved? She says, I haven't done a thing but believe. I said, that's all you need to do, is believe. Oh, God is asking you to believe him, to pray with some expectation, and don't go by what you see or feel or others say or what Job's friends tell you you look like and all of that. You just believe God and his word. He encourages you. There are no limitations even on the nature of your request, as long as it isn't out of harmony with the will of God. Uh, there are no limitations on how much you can ask him. So many of us are so poverty-stricken because we've been taught that you measure spirituality in terms of how poor you are and how many patches you have on your pants. That's not God's word. Abraham was a rich man, and I'm, I'm an heir of Abraham by faith, and I'm not going to live below my inheritance because then I have to take all of my time concerning myself with how to get ahead every day and spend a lot of time in prayer praying for my needs. If I claim my needs met and live in that kind of faith, I can spend that hour in prayer praying for you or for something in the kingdom of God. And so there are no limitations. I've seen God answer prayers for our finances from $400 to $30,000. There are no limits on God. A woman in our church one time said, uh, we've got three days to pay our income tax, and we discovered we owe $400 more, and we don't have it. And, of course, she knew what to do because we know what to do in our church. She said, I want the church to agree with me that the 400 comes in three days, that, that we have the money. I said, well, that's no problem. We agree with you. Just a simple prayer in the name of Jesus. Three days later, the money didn't come. She, now, wait a minute. I've been preaching all along. You don't want circumstances. She went down to the tax office, and when the adjuster looked at it, he said, well, look, you're overpaying $400. <laughs> Well, God didn't need to supply the money because they were overpaying the amount they needed. And so they got it that way. Oh, he's wonderful. You go to the bank for a loan on your home for, uh, to, to mortgage it, and they'll say, well, we can allow you 12000 but that's a limit. But there are no limits on God. Brother said to me, I've got to have $30,000, and I've got to have it right away. You said we could agree. I said, then I agree in Jesus' name. I went to preach in a meeting where he was leading the meeting one time. I'd forgotten all about him because I'm agreeing with people all the time all over the place. And I got up and was preaching along the line of agreement where two are agreed, and uh, you better uh, better work, friends, or somebody along the line will be, be challenging that, you know. And I didn't recognize him as the one I'd agreed for $30,000 for. And he got up after the message. He says, now let me say something. Of course, you never know what people are going to say. He said, I want to tell you it works. He doesn't remember me, but he agreed with me in Columbus, Ohio, a year ago for $30,000. He said, I want to tell him and you that when I got back home, I got the money. It came in a few days. Hallelujah. Yes, it works. You see, the prayer of faith is a prayer of expectation. It's believing God will do what he says. It's not doubting because of circumstances or symptoms or anything else. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me? I think the time is up. You've just...